And we need to realize that God is still in his church. Now, maybe a lot of people don't realize that this morning. And if, and if Jesus walked in the front door of some of these churches this morning, would they recognize him? Would they know that he was Jesus? Because they're wrapped up so much in their own things is Jesus to be known amongst them. So Father, we ask you this morning to be with us as we continue in your word. And Lord, this morning we say we welcome you. We welcome you into our presence and we say, Lord, have your way here this morning. Let your spirit be with us and we give you free reign in this service this morning, Lord. As a matter of fact, Lord, I say just step me out of the way and let your word come forth with power and with love in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so we look this morning, I have a message entitled, um, Jesus is the Destroyer of Death. Now, my daughter came to me, and I hope she gets to see this, because she came to me and showed me a couple of stones that she had, and somebody told her, and she looked up on the internet, and on the internet it says they were a lap full of little doozy or something. A lap of little doozy. Or whatever. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't call it exactly right, right at this moment. But I looked it up on the internet, and sure enough, it says it was in Exodus chapter 20, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Isaiah, bring up Isaiah chapter 54 for a second, and verse 11. Now it says, and it, and, and it read exactly like the Word of God is reading here on the screen that you're going to see when, when she brings it up. And it said that word, at the very last word, it said this word that she was telling me. Lap a little Lucy or whatever it is. But in the King James Bible, it says with sapphires. And the internet, they quoted the um, uh, strong concordance and they gave the same number. Well, I just so happen to have a strong concordance. And I looked it up there. And it also says sapphires, and it says nothing about that name. So where did that name come from? Well, I went back onto my browser this morning on the internet, and I find out that it is a Latin word. And that Latin word simply means blue stone. So I remember looking at her two stones that she showed me that somebody had given to her. And I said, well, you know, does that look like a sapphire? So I punched it again on my browser, and I said, what does a sapphire look like? And lo and behold, it's blue. But does it look like the stones that she had? Well, what she was showing me looked like mosaic stones, like these Indians are making this jewelry out of, mosaic-like stone, you know, this blue or green-looking stone. It, to me, it was a world of difference. But now I'm only looking at it through the Bible. I find no reference in the Strong's or in the Bible whatsoever to this Latin word. So how did they get it in there? And how are they saying that it was on there? They're saying that simply because it's a blue stone. And so if I was reading Latin, that's the words that I would say. You know, when I was reading this sentence up here. I would say a blue stone if I knew what a sapphire looked like. Until this morning, well, I probably did, but not as vivid as I see it right now. A blue stone is a really beautiful, uh, that sapphire is a really beautiful stone. And the thing we have to look at is why then is, um, would they bring up something like this? Well, because Heaven is going to be one of the most beautiful places that you could ever visit and ever go to. And when uh, Aaron wore this breast on his on his front of him with with these uh, uh, different colored stones, they were highly prized. They were expensive stones, just like our city in heaven is going to be very expensive. 
And there won't be something you just carry around as a trinket in your pocket because it would be too expensive to do that. And so this is what he was uh, in significance of one of the tribes of the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, one of the churches, if you will, today. And so do our churches look like that stones today? I think they do. Because I think they're not as brilliant and shining as, as God wants us to be. And so that's where we come to this message this morning. I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26. Now God gave me this message and then this comes up. And so it kind of goes around with this morning's message. He says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, people say, oh, they're better off now. They're in a better place and they're this and they're that. Well, yeah, if they're saved, they are. If, if, if they didn't die saved, they'd be in a whole lot worse place than they are now. You can believe that. Because it's going to be quite warm there and no air conditioning and no ice water, no cold beer or whatever else that they think they're going. And they're not going to find it where they're going to be. So is where the Christian is, yeah, he's in a better place. But what about if they're not saved? Are they in a better place? Well, the Lord says the last enemy that's going to be destroyed is death. So ask yourself then this morning, who can save us from death? We all are going to die. We're all condemned to die, but who can save us? Well, we, we look at a man called Jesus. Who is he? Well, according to the Bible, turn back to verse 24 now, or up, or yeah, back to verse 24, you then verse 26. It says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And so Jesus is our friend. He's our intercessor in heaven. He's our coming king. He's the one that's going to destroy us and save us from death. Now what is death? Well, you look at death maybe differently than what the Bible looks at it because the Bible looks at death as a... You see, when we were born, we are going to live forever. It just... In what place are you going to live forever? So if you go to the place other than the place God wants you to go to, then that's death. And the Bible talks about the second death. Well, your body is going into the ground and it's going to decompose and go back to the dust from which God made it, your flesh body. But your spirit body is going to return to God. Now, when your spirit returns to God, we call that judgment day. Okay, it's appointed once to die and then the judgment. So that's judgment day. And so instantly, once you die, you're going to be standing in front of God to be judged. Are you going to stand there as a Christian or are you going to be standing there as somebody who had it their way? Well, you got it your way in this life and you didn't do it God's way. Now, if you're going to stand in front of God having done it your way, what is he going to say to you? Welcome in, my good and faithful servant? Or is he going to say, depart from me because I don't even know you? Now you have to make a decision this morning if you want to listen to what the world has to say or do you want to listen to what God has to say? In order for us to be a Christian this morning, we have to do and listen to what God says and not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. So that means we're going to have to, you know, start paying attention when God tells us to do something, we're going to have to start doing what he says. And so, seeing how important it is that God gives us these different signs. Now, these stones that these people are talking about, this blue stone in the... Um, now, that's just what it says in the, in the Latin. It's called a blue stone. And it, it, it's significant because these are signs that God has given us in the end times. Are they signs to Christians? Searching for God, because they call this blue stone, um, it can be a stone of meditation, it can be a stone of healing, but God says, I sent my word and healed them. And God says that we're supposed to pray to him, okay? 
And so think about what, what people are being led away by or what's happening in their lives. Are they listening to God or are they listening to what some person tells them? You know, all the things that people are doing today that are important, they are important doctrines. And uh, this is an important thing. Are you listening to God or are you listening to what some man said? Well, some man said this, that, and the other about these stones, but then what does the Bible say about them? Are they sapphires? Because you just read it on the screen. They're sapphires. And there's a world of difference in a sapphire and these uh, lollapaloozies, whatever they are, stones. So I'm not saying that they're not, because from what I read, it doesn't look to me like they are, but... Um, you have to make the distinction yourself. You have to make up your mind. Do you believe that this is of God or something else? If you go to the King James Bible, it says they're sapphires. And just, I've got five other versions of the Bible, and all of them say sapphires. But now on the internet, it says the Bible says they're this other name, so whatever. And there's no accident that people are doing what they're doing today. You know, it's, um, I believe there's an apostate movement and there are messages out there that we have to take note of today. You know, when we um, look at Revelation chapter 17, for instance, we have the, um, the woman, they call her the mother of whores. Yeah, the mother of hearts. And what is her teaching? Well, she's attacking the sound doctrine in the churches and in the Bible. Now, personally, I'm a word man. I read the Word of God and I go by what God's Word has to say. I don't deviate this way or that way from it. And when I look at it and the Bible says sapphires, I say, well, you know what? I want to see what a sapphire looks like. And if somebody shows me something that's not a sapphire, and they claim that it's in the Bible, and they give me the verse in the Bible that this sapphire is supposed to be in, and I read that verse, and it's saying something else other than the sapphire, then what is it? Is it of God? I don't see how it could be, because God never changes. His word is steadfast, it's true, and it never changes. So who's done the change in him? Who's put something else in there that God didn't have in there for us? God wants us to be knowledgeable in his word. He says, because my people are perished because of lack of knowledge. And the thing is, people are listening to things in this world, and they're gaining worldly knowledge, but are they gaining the knowledge of God? You know, uh, the devil came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And the first thing he said to Eve, Yea, hath God said, is this really what God said? Now, you can say the same thing about these stones, couldn't you? Is it what God really said? Well, the devil went on. If you'll read chapter 3, it's not that long. But if you like the first seven verses, for instance, but if you'll read in the first seven verses, he talks to the man and the woman like, you know, hey, God wants you to be God's. He says, if you'll just take this fruit and eat it, you'll be as God's. Now, we know that was a lie. We know that was a lie. But yet we got all these people today that are thinking they're gods. And they're going to be gods. And uh, uh, <laughs> that's not so. We're God's created beings. God made us. And he made us in his image, but he did not make us gods. So this is the first lie that the devil come with, that we would be gods. But see... We misinterpreted that. He said you'd be as gods. He did not say you would be gods. You see, this stone that he, she brought to me, yeah, it's like it's like a, a, a sapphire because it's got a blue color to it. But is it a sapphire? Or are you a god? Do you see, neither one of them are, are true, are they? We are not gods and we will not be gods. <laughs> and how could this stone be a sapphire because it doesn't look like one. I had a Muslim, like I told you before, tell me one time, oh, well, you could be Jesus. I, mean, I can be Jesus. Anybody can be Jesus. And I said, well, sure, I can be Jesus. All I have to do is 
My mother would have me and she'd be, been a virgin and not be, you know, had sex with a man, just be a virgin and have me as a child. And I said, I could be born like that. I could live a life and never sin a bit in my whole life. And then I could die on the cross for the sins of all the people in the world. And then I could ascend up to heaven and sit on the right hand of God. Yeah, I could be Jesus. He looked at me and said, man, you're crazy. You can't do that. I said, that's right. Only Jesus could. And only Jesus did. And that's what you need to realize. We can't be Jesus. We can't be God. We were not made it that way. It's like saying the church pew could be a car. Well, we don't have any wheels for one. So we don't have an engine or a motor. Or, you know, we don't have no doors. But how can it be a car? You know? So you just realize we are what we are. God created us and we need to be happy the way he created us. And enjoy what we do have. As we find out we don't have anything after a while, people fail to realize the blindness that they believe that the Jews are under. See, they talk about the Jews are under a blindness, but you know, this blindness has come upon the Gentiles. They're, they're blinded. They see the, all these things out here and they're going to compare them with the, the, the spiritual things of God. Well, that just shows how blind they are. You know? Because we have to realize there is only one God, one Creator, and one Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Gog and Magog, and he talks about in the end times in Ezekiel chapter 38, as well as um, uh, in, the, in the book of Revelation, I believe that they are Satan's massive army. Um, they are, <laughs> maybe you're not going to like this, they're counterfeit Christians. There are people that say that they know God. We're going to like our churches today. Our churches are full. Uh, turn to Ezekiel 38 for a second. Okay, verse 4. He says, And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth. And all thine army, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So why is God bringing... <laughs> God is bringing this now. You see that? He says, I will do it. So God is bringing this out, you see? And why is God bringing all these out with hooks in them, like a fish hook stuck in his jaw, bringing them out? Well, that's what he's doing, because God is using this to judge his church. That's what's going on. God is judging us. Are we going to listen to what his word has to say, or are we going to listen to what some man has to tell us? This is what this is all about this morning. This is what it's all about in your life, in the world. Are you going to listen to what God says, or are you going to listen to what the, the world has to tell you? And so, there is a deception going on in the world, and... The Bible says God is going to send them strong delusion that they could believe a lie. Because God wants to know exactly where you stand at this morning. Are you standing with Him or are you running with the world? We have to make a choice. That's why I said I'm a word person. I believe every word that's in this Word of God. And when then somebody says it's in the Bible, I want to look it up and I want to see it. And if it's not in the Bible, then it's not of God. Just that simple. There's a lot of good people in this world. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were good people. But Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 23, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you would no wise enter into the kingdom of God. So you're not going to heaven because they wasn't going to heaven. <laughs> and so where is heaven? It's God's home, isn't it? It's where God lives. The Bible says heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool. And so, is, is God here on the earth with us? Is he here with us this morning? Yes. But he's also everywhere else in this world at the same time. And so, whenever you're doing something that you know that you shouldn't be doing, you know God's here. He sees what you're doing. And if you're listening to the deception of the devil, God sees that too. What are you going to do about it? Do you, God doesn't want another war in his heaven. You know, the Bible said there was war in heaven and Satan was cast out. 
So God says, you know what? In the end times, I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And God wants to make sure that you're going to be righteous. And the only way you're going to be righteous is listening to what God has to say and not what the world has to say. And so the faithfulness of God's word is not being witnessed and it's not being preached anymore in his churches. Instead, now we have churches that are teaching whatever. They're having worship services uh, that are pure entertainment. That's what they are. They're false doctrines. There are abominations being done by the people that's in the churches. And they're doing it all in the face of God. Right there, acting like, oh, this is God's house. But yet, what are they doing? Worshiping Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, Halloween. What else is next? They going to downright have sex in some of the churches? Come on now. It's, it's just getting ridiculous out there. And if we listen to all this doctrine that the world brings by, then they're wanting to lead you away from God and not towards God. You know, one man told me, he said, you know what? I've come to listen to your preaching because i got enough disbelief and unbelief of my own. I don't need somebody to help me not believe. I need somebody to help me to believe. I don't need all these people telling me how not to believe. And he said, that's what most of the churches are doing. They're leading us in the wrong direction. And why? Well, money, that's why. The love of money. They all want money. Revelation chapter 20 says in verse 8, He shall go out to deceive the nations which are at the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog. We got churches all over the world. He's talking about the churches when he's saying Gog and Magog. These are people that have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power. And they're teaching false doctrine. And he says, I'm going to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as a sand of the sea. In verse 9 he says, And then they went up on the breadth of the earth, they compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, which is Jerusalem, <laughs> and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You can take all your false uh, prophecy and your, your churchianity and all these other things that are not of God, but God's going to come down with fire and he's going to destroy it. He's, what he said here. Then in verse 10, and the devil that deceived them, you see, and why would the devil need to deceive them if there wasn't Christians? So he's talking about people who claim to be Christians. They're going to some kind of a church. They're listening to this false doctrine of the devil out there. And they're doing all the things that the devil wants them to do. And he says he took the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Verse 10. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now how long is forever and ever? Now we got churches out there like I told you here a few weeks ago that I found out the church of Christ don't even believe in hell. They don't believe there's a heaven either. How can this be? The Bible specifically says they're going to go into a hell to be tormented forever and ever. Jehovah's Witnesses said, no, you're going to be destroyed and that's going to be the end of it. Well, how can this be what the Bible says? That's why I'm telling you, you have to be a word person. What does the Word of God have to say? And what they're saying, is it lining up with the Word of God? If it's not, then it can't be of God, can it? There has to be something that the devil's put into their mouth. Or giving them an illusion like they're being real, but they're not being real. The Old Testament calls death the king of terrors. In Job chapter 18 and verse 14, it says, His confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle, and it shall bring him the king of terrors. So death is a king of terror. People are afraid of dying. They don't know what's going to happen on the other side. I know one man that knew what was going to happen on the other side, and he's there with the Lord now. Charlie sat right back there in the back, and he said, I know where I'm going. I'm going to be with the Lord. And I'm not going to do something that's not going to get me with God when I'm going from here. And he said, I know where I'm going. I know who I believe. Yeah. We sang that song like she sang, look for me one day in here. And he said, well, 
He told me back there in the office one morning, he said, you look for me when you get there. He said, I'm going ahead of you, but I know I'm going before you go. He said, but when I get there, I'm going to be waiting. You look for me. I'll be there. Just like your wife said. That's what he told me. Yeah. You know, he says, uh, the Bible tells us that we need to be aware that the devil is walking around like a roaring lion. And what does the lion want to do? He's hungry. <laughs> he wants to eat you. <laughs> you know, and how does the devil want to deal with us? You know, he doesn't understand. And a lot of people think, oh, they, they give the devil all kind of power. No, he's going to be the king of hell. He's not going to be anything no more than what you are. He's going to be sent there for punishment. That's what he's going there for. He's not going there to be the king. He's going there just like anybody else to be punished, to burn in the lake of fire for eternity. He's not going to be nothing. And don't try to make him something today. Some people say, well, if you give him an inch, he'll think he's a ruler. Well, he might think it, but it will never happen. You know, every trial of human experience that we have ever done will end in the grave. We are going to die, every one of us. We need to get that through our heads. And even God in Christ called death an enemy, you know. And it, it as the message of the first Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26 says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. When our Lord created our first parents and put them in the garden of Eden, it was his purpose that they would live forever under the mercy of God. But the devil come in. Remember, I just told you a moment ago about the devil coming in. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, he says a serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said. And then the serpent said to the woman in verse 4, You will not die. You're not going to die. Is that right? How many people are saying today they're going to be gods? And they are gods. But yet they're going to die. So they're going to listen to the devil, what the devil says, but well, then how come they're dying? Because the devil said they're not going to die. You know what he was talking about? Our spirits are not going to die. That's what he was talking about. He didn't go so far as to tell that to the man and woman in the garden. Because when you were born and your spirit was multiplied to you from your parents, from your dad specifically, he multiplied his spirit and the woman furnished the body and the man multiplied his spirit. And so that means whatever bad was in him, he multiplied to you when you was born and you had to deal with all the bad things that he, he had within him besides all the bad things you got all on your own you got to deal with. So don't tell me you come into this world without any sin. You come into this world as a sinner. You were born totally in sin. In, the Bible said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Look it up in the Psalms, chapter 51 and 52. It talks all about it. And so, God did not intend us to die. He created us to live forever. But where is that forever going to be? Death is going to be the last enemy that's destroyed. That means that God, is when he comes back, when this world is done over, he's coming back to get the bodies that you have. And he's going to take that little bit of dust, wherever it's at, if it's been burnt up in the fire, if it's been eaten by maggots, wherever that dust of you is at when you died and after you died, and if it was burned all over the earth, God's going to bring it all back and he's going to bring you back to life and he's going to put your spirit back in and he's going to give you immortality. You're going to live forever in that body. The people in hell are going to live forever in their bodies. That's why he raises them up at the last day at the great white throne judgment. They get their bodies back, but they get their bodies back in the condition their bodies was in when they died. We get an immortal body, a body that will never die again, never see pain, never have sickness, never have anything wrong with it. That's what we're going to gain. What they're going to gain, if it was full of arthritis and cancer and everything, if every bone in their body was broken, they're going to have that, plus they're going to be in hell with that. That's not much of a reward, is it? 
you know, when it comes down that death is going to be, capture us all, we just need to realize that death is coming. Death is coming to Pine Grove. <laughs> death is already here in Pine Grove. Just about every week you see some hurts backed up somewhere picking somebody up. We better realize we're going to die. Have you got your destination planned? Because if you have made no plans, well, no plans is, is the same as I'm planning on going to hell. That's right. No decision for Christ. Well, that means you're planning on going to hell because he's the only one that can save you. He is the only strength, the only thing that we can look at. And you can say, well, not today. Well, maybe not. But it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. You're going to die one day. Are you prepared to meet Jesus as your judge? Have you done what he said to do or have you listened to the world? In God's ultimate and infinite purpose, time is coming when death is going to be completely and totally destroyed and swallowed up in victory. You know, the face of death is interwoven in our lives. For years, I have stood and watched People come to this church and I say, I can, boy, I see their faces right in front of me even right now this morning. That where they sit here in this church and now they passed away. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that their heart was right with God when they, when they left this earth. But if it wasn't, I know where they're at. I know because God's word tells me that and I believe God. You know, the seals are open which begins the tribulation period, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw the Lamb. So who's opening these seals? Jesus. We need to realize that. And we read the book of Revelation. Revelation, they talk about the apocalypse. Okay, there's another word like this, Lapalooshi stone or whatever it is. It's just a, uh, a catchy sounding name that sounds like something. An apocalypse. Oh, we're, we're about to have the apocalypse. Well, apocalypse is a Greek word that simply means revelation, or, if you will, unveiling. That means when you take the cover off of something, it's a revelation. You get to see something that you didn't see. That's simply all apocalypse means. And look at the meanings that the people of the world have said about apocalypse. Well, you know what? One of the mo most amazing pictures in human life is found in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. The Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And you know what? A lot of people say, That's Jesus. How can it be Jesus if he's opened the seal? And let this out. How can it be Jesus? That ought to tell you something to begin with. And here you have, here you have, it says it's a white horse. You say, well, Jesus is coming back with a white horse. Okay, that's, that's fine. And then, and then you have one that says he had a bow. But nothing about any arrows with it. He just has a bow. He's got a big mouth. That's what he's got. And he don't have nothing to back it up. He's got a bow and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Jesus ain't tried to conquer nothing. You come to him all of yourself. You don't have to have somebody make you come to him. And you don't have to force. You don't have to do none of that. You come to Jesus all by yourself. This is the devil he's talking about. That's who he's talking about. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He's talking about the devil. Verse 3 says, When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. Verse 4, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat there alone to take peace from the earth. You think Jesus is going to ride with a bunch of the other ones that are doing all this stuff? Taking peace from the earth? When Jesus himself said, I come that you might have peace? I give you peace? You know, come on now. You know this can't be Jesus in, don't you? And that they should kill one another? 
and there was given to him a great sword. Yeah, we got war all over this planet. We've had a war on this planet ever since time began. And it isn't going to stop anytime soon. You know, we had a little lapse, uh, a little part of time that we didn't have war, and that's when Jesus was here. There wasn't no wars going on. But just as soon as he left, all hell broke loose again, didn't it? Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the first, the third, the third beast saying, Come and see. And I beheld a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. What he's talking about here, this is what people had to eat in the day's time. This is their food for one day. And it took everything that that person made to provide enough food for one day and one day only. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The oil is the Holy Spirit. The wine is God's people. Don't you touch God's people. You keep your hand off of them the same way he told Satan when he, uh, when he talked about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, you let me touch him and I'll do this to him and I'll do that. But God says, no. That's what God said, no. And then Satan come back after he destroyed everything that Job had. He said, well, you let me touch his skin then. Okay, God says you can touch his skin, but you can't kill him. See, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Don't you hurt my precious Holy Spirit, and don't you put your hands on my people. That's what God's saying right here. You may have to work every day for just a little bit of food that you're going to have. And what you're going to have to eat when we get to this point in time, you ain't going to have nothing else. It's going to take all you have just to provide your daily food. And then the next seal was opened, verse 7, chapter 7. After he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the beast say, Come and see, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And then his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed after him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. This is a picture of what's going to happen on planet earth here in the very near future. We're going to see this happening right now. And you know something, if you look on the news and you look at some of these countries over there and you wonder why are they suffering and why are they starving and why? Here it is, it's right here in the Bible. And what have they done over there? They've rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what they've done. They've rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. They have something, some sort of a religion. They have their own gods, but they don't have the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Yes, He is God. And He's going to be the one that stops all this mess, and He's the only one that can stop it. You know, we may choose to war ourselves against that final enemy. Our doctors are warring against that enemy, death. They're trying to keep people from dying all the time. You run to the doctor every time you turn around. You go, oh, I got this wrong with me, and I got you trying to preserve your life. Well, there's only one that can preserve your life. He says, I sent my word and healed them. Why don't we listen to what he has to say? And quit. I'm 75 years old up here now, you know. I'm not no young chicken no more. I'm 75 years old up here, and I've been listening to God. I can tell you and I can show you people right here in Pine Grove, West Virginia that look like my great-grandfather. And they're 20 years younger than me. What's happening? It's the sin curse that's what's happening. Sin is destroying them and they won't leave that stuff. They won't leave it and all they can think about is their sinfulness and doing all, all these sinful things. And it's aging them. Sin is destroying their lives and they're letting it happen. And they're saying it in the name of my God. Well, that's a lie. It's not in the name of their God. Well, it is in their God, maybe, but not my God. You know, just like they talk about the Big Bang Theory. You know, oh, the Big Bang Theory. Everything came out of the Big Bang. Yeah. Well, their Big Bang and my Big Bang two different Big Bangs. My Big Bang is God said, let there be light. And there was light. That's my Big Bang. And then he created all things. And without him was not anything made that was made. 
John chapter 1, verse 1. You know, I can go home and I can close my house up and I can lock the doors and I can say, Okay, death, you can't get here. Okay, death, you can't come in here. And what good is it going to do? Huh? Because the devil and death is going to come through that door. He's going to come through the walls. He's going to come through the roof. He's going to come after you. Yeah, but Jesus says, I have the keys. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. He came out of the grave. He says, I have the keys of hell and of death. I am the one that's going to destroy it. You know, if I say I'm going to stand up and confront the death, what is death going to do to me? Going to cut me down? If I say I'm going to take my strength and I'm going to war against the death, then my flesh is going to fall from my bones, isn't it? We need to understand that we cannot fight this enemy. It's coming for us. You can run to every doctor in the country to try to preserve yourself, but death is coming for you. No matter what you do, you're not going to stop it. Death is coming after us. You can see the sockets of your face don't have any eyes in it. We have a vivid picture in one of the scriptures of a nuclear bomb and the people's eyeballs and their face melt off of them. You know, and if I say I'm going to protect my loved ones from this vicious and violent enemy, I'm going to make sure they get their shots. I'm going to make sure they get an education, but they're going to still die. The enemy still going to get us. It's coming for us now. And then you know what? You're going to see. You go to the great garden, dig up one you put in there. You'll see them rotted away. You're going to see the eyeballs left there their face, you're going to see maggots have destroyed their bodies. One of the most awful things in my life I seen when I was in Dominican, I seen the carnage that we had left behind. I was down there fighting a war, defending my country. I thought at the time when I was doing my duty and I was, I was proud to go there and do my part. I was a man that wanted to defend my country and when people shot at us, we, we responded with our weapons and fired back. And after it was all over, there was, it was so stinking and smelly down there that you couldn't even walk around and hardly breathe the air because it was like 120 degrees in the shade. And there was dead bodies everywhere. And they called a ceasefire. And they says, <laughs> you know, we need to get these dead bodies up because everybody even that ain't sick is going to be sick if we didn't do something about it. They said, we need some volunteers to pick up these bodies, you, 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 and you. And guess who was one of the yous? You know, and I've seen all these bodies and I recognize I was part of that. I was part of that problem. I was part of the ones that the ones that caused this. And amongst them wasn't just soldiers who had been fighting. There were women and children. And there was a lot of things that was destroyed. And for what? If I go down to Dominican today, it's a beautiful place. And, 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 and they've got all these uh, places that you can go and, and, and live at. And it's just a beautiful place, just like Vietnam today. Well, what was all that fight and killing going on about when we was there? Why did all them people have to die? You know, why? why? We're going to die enough. We're going to die soon enough without having to go down there and kill each other like that. So why was all that going on? You know, did our, com our, did our country deceive us or did somebody else deceive us? No, the devil deceived the people. The devil made us think that this is the way to go and this is the right thing to do. But this is not God's way. God says, forgive. Love one another as I have loved you. You know, and Abraham... One of the things about that we talked about in Genesis, turn to Genesis 23. When Abraham's wife died, he had to do something with her body, you know. And he goes to these people in the land, he says, let me bury my dead out of my sight. And he's talking about his beloved Sarah, the woman that he loved probably more than his own life, you know. It says in verse 7 of Genesis chapter 23, Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, 
if it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me to Ephron, the son of Zobar. You know, if I say like the Bible tells us in, 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 um, in the Psalms, if I flee to the mountains, am I going to get away from God? If I say to the hills, oh, hide me from his presence, or if I go down to the deepest ocean, am I going to get away from God? Well, what if I say, if I ascend into hell, behold, he's out there. So whether are you going to flee from the presence of God? Where can you go that you're going to get away from God that he's not going to be? I go past the ocean, you know. Where are you going to go from death? Where are you going to go on this planet that you can't find death? Or death can't find you? You're going to hide somewhere? Yeah, you're going to hide somewhere. You can hide in Jesus. Because he has the keys of hell and death. And he's going to destroy death. That last enemy that's going to be destroyed is going to be destroyed by Jesus himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. You know, and as you know, for all these years I have preached, thus saith the Lord. And one of the things that I have, have seen and been sensitive to, I think everywhere, some of the monuments that we have out here today that, that are preserving death. Take a look at all the tombstones and stuff that we have. Anywhere that you go, they've got on TV, they talk about this monument for 9-11. You go up there and you see all the soldiers that have died in the wars, and they got a monument for them. they got all these monuments that they're recognizing that all these people have died. You know? And then what about the, one, the tomb of the unknown soldier? That is, poor individual has gone somewhere and nobody knows who he was. And yet he's given his life and he's died. And they don't even know his name. And no one, he's called the unknown soldier. God help us. Look at what we're doing to one another. We should be loving one another instead of listening to what the devil has to say. You know, we're, we're in this here together and all we have is each other. One day we're going to have the Lord. And we're going to be at home with the Lord. And with all the loved ones that have believed in the Lord, they're going to be there with us. But we have to go through this time. We have to go through this period here. Because God doesn't want us into heaven if we're going to be all on our own. And we're going to do what we want us to do. And we're going to do just the opposite of what God wants us. He's going to have more problems. So he needs to see where we're at today. Are you standing with him? Or are you standing with the world? That's what you need to decide. If you haven't given your life over to Christ this morning, is the time to do it. He said, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You know, outside of Washington, they have the tomb of George and Martha Washington. You know, they call it they call it the Washington Monument. It's built in what? Memory to the dead. In Jerusalem. You can go, go to Jerusalem today. Are you going to find Jesus in the tomb? Huh? They got a place they said his tomb was at. But is he there? He's been risen from the dead. He's not in the tomb. But you go over into the Muslim part of it. They got, they got Muhammad's remains. They got Muhammad there. You won't find the tomb of Jesus because he is risen. And if we believe in him, we're going to rise. His tomb is empty. And ours is going to be empty. There's nobody in his tomb. You know, we go to Matthew chapter 28. We have the story of our the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 1, the end of the Sabbath. You see so many people keeping the Sabbath, which is Saturday. And we're having church and today is Sunday. It says at the end of the Sabbath. Don't they understand it? We're not, this isn't the Sabbath day. This is Sunday. This is the day that the Lord rose from the dead. You know? And the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven 
and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Can you imagine this theory now? You, there's two women, they're walking out to the graveyard, and they said, Jesus is out here in the tomb. There's a great big stone in front of the door, and you get to the front of the tomb, and it's standing open, and sitting on the top of it is God's angel. I can't even, I can't even comprehend if I had went there, how it would have felt. I would have seen this glistening, shining angel sitting on top of a stone that would take several men to move, and these women standing there just looking at it. Like, oh man, what is this? And so, what happens? He says in verse 3, His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was as white as snow. That's what he looked like in their words. It looked like the lightning shining, sitting up there on that stone. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. What is it to become like a dead man? Is it to be on your knees crawling around? How many dead men you see on their knees crawling around? If they were like dead men, they was laying there like they was dead. They were so afraid they got knocked down and they was laying there as dead. And then women were looking at him like, what's up with all this? You know, and they're looking at that angel. You know, as a child of God, you know an angel when you see one. Don't you? Huh? You know the devil when you see what the devil's doing. Verse 5, And the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not you, for I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Come and see the place where he lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall I see you. There shall you see him, lo, I have told you. Let me tell you something. You better believe God this morning. Because if you don't, you're going to believe the devil this afternoon. Just that simple. You will either believe God this morning, or you'll believe the devil this afternoon. In 1 Corinthians 15, Marie turn there. But in, while she's turning, I want to tell you a verse in Romans chapter 8 says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus, in verse 11, from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit dwelling inside of you. And if you do not have Jesus' spirit, then you do not belong to him. But we have a picture in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have, verse 54, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? Verse 55. O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, verse 57, which giveth us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're going to die, every one of us, unless we're caught up together with the Lord when He returns at the end of the world. We all will die. But you know what? I know in whom I have believed. And even though I may be in the grave when he returns, if you go out there and dig me up, where you planted me in the grave, if I've been dead, if I've been dead a hundred years or a thousand years, you go out there in that grave, you're not going to find me. Where are you going to find me? Either in the air on my way up, or I'm going to be with the Lord in heaven. And somebody said, well, where's heaven at? Where Jesus is. Okay, whether it's going to be in, in, up in the air, in heaven, if it's in another dimension, if it's here on earth, it's going to be where the Lord is. That's where heaven is. I'm not going to argue one way or the other where heaven's at or where it isn't at. I just know it's where God is. In verse 30 of Luke chapter 9, he speaks of Moses and Elijah and about the decease of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Verse 30, Behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So here, he's on Mount Transfiguration. Jesus is transfigured. He looks like he had already gone to heaven and everything when he's talking with Moses and Elijah and they're talking about what Jesus is going to do on the cross. And we have people that's preaching in our churches today and they stand up there saying Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and he was praying so hard it was like great drops of blood coming out of him because he didn't want to go to the cross. He knew that's what he was going to do. He didn't want to be separated from God. And how bad is it that you don't want to be separated from God? Think about that. How bad is it to be separated from God? Well, if you go to hell, you'll find out how bad it is to be separated from God. You'll be alone in hell. There will be billions of people there. You will all be alone. There won't be no friend that you can touch, touch or talk to or anything. They'll be there with you, but you won't be having a conversation with them. It'll be like constant falling, a constant burning, a con a constant awareness of your surrounding that you can do nothing about. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, he says in verse 5, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. You see there? Moses died. Moses was what we call the great lawgiver. Oh, he wasn't the giver. He brought the word of God down to us in the tables that God wrote on stone. In, in, in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, talks about Elijah. It came to pass as they went on and talked that, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now here, here is a man who didn't die. This man went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now he, he had to be transfigured, and he had to be changed. And this is what's going to happen to us when we get ready to go, whether we're dead or whether we're alive, we're going to be changed. When we go up into heaven with God, because flesh and blood cannot go into heaven. Flesh and spirit can but flesh and blood came. Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And he went back. It says he went back, and he took a hold of his clothes, but the mantle from Elijah fell on him when he went back. And Elijah, Elisha that was with him picked up the mantle of Elijah and smacked the waters, and he said, Wherefore is the God Elijah? And the waters parted, and he walked across the dry land. Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did, because he had a double portion of what Elijah had. <laughs> because that's what he wanted. He wanted to do twice as much as his teacher had done. You know, verse 14 says, He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. The man walked across just like the Red Sea was parted. The water here was parted for him the same way. And this is what? This is a representation of what's going to happen when we go up in with the Lord. Now, the rapture of the church is going to happen, yes. But it's not going to be some secret thing. The Bible says every eye is going to behold him. Everyone is going to see what's happening. The church is going to go up just as the last part of the wrath of God is coming down. Just like Noah and his, the, his wife and his three sons and their wives, when they got into the ark, then the flood started down on the earth. So just as they got into safety, when, when, when Lot was coming out of uh, Sodom, Fire and brimstone was raining down on Sodom. So just as we're going up, guess what? The wrath of God is coming back on those that are going to be left behind. There won't be another chance 
If you're not ready to go where the Lord calls His people home, you're not going. The day of day, the, today is the day to get saved. If you wait until you die, it's a point of worse to die and then the judgment. So like if you go to take a drink of water and you put the glass to your lips, before that water gets into your belly and you have died, you're standing in the presence of God. That's how fast it's going to happen within a split second. It's going to be told you again and hold you right there in front of God. Because the Bible says without the spirit, the body is dead. So when God drags your spirit out of your body and you stand before him, that body is going to fall down. It's going to be dead and your spirit is going to be standing in front of God, Jesus Christ, and to be just. Are you going to be judged for being a good Christian? Or are you going to be judged for being something else? You have to make a decision. Do I want to do what God says or do I want to continue in my own confusion? Mark chapter 5, verse 41. Jesus said, took the damsel by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kumi, which is being interpreted. Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Jesus took a young girl and touched her hand there and says, get up out of there. You're going to live some more. And then he went to the son, a, a widow of, of name. In Luke chapter 7, verse 14, he came and touched the beard that they, that they were carrying the dead person on. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto you, arise. He went to Lazarus in the tomb. In John chapter 11, verse 43, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead, verse 44, came forth bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus said, Loose him and let him go. Let me tell you something. He's going to call us out of the grave. Are you ready to get out of the grave? Can you hear him talking to you this morning? If you can hear him now, harden up your heart. Listen to what he's saying. If you can hear his voice this morning, he's calling you. And he will do the same. And those that have died, they're already with him. If they can hear his voice here, they'll hear his voice in the grave. You know, we have God's assurance that we're going to triumph over the grave. You know, how do I make up the words to tell you? Where how do I frame the words that we're going to have victory over the grave? What can I say to make you understand this morning that we're going to come out of the grave? What, what words can I use? I'm, I'm, I'm lost with these simple words that I have in my mind, in my vocabulary. I'm, 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 I'm at loss. What can I say? How can I bring the words out that will make you believe that we're dead and we're going to rise again? What do I have to say? What, what, can, what words can I give you? I've got a limited amount of words to use because who am I? I'm just a man like you. <laughs> and I'm a sinful man like you. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And, and that means everybody. That doesn't exclude preachers or, or babies or any except for all that sin that come short of the glory of God. You know, in chapter 1 of Revelation, he says in verse 18, I got it down here right now, I was telling you about a while ago. I am he that liveth and was dead. Now, it's hard for you to recognize. You've been to funeral homes and you've seen dead people. That, brother, that dead person sit up in that casket and say, I was, I was laying dead there a minute ago, now I'm alive. This is what Jesus is saying to us here. I was dead, now I'm alive, and I'm going to live forever. Amen. And what else did he say, Marie? After amen? And have the keys of hell and death. He's got the keys. The devil don't have them. He has them. You want to get to heaven, you've got to go through Jesus. No other way. You're not going to get there with your religion. You're not going to get to heaven by being good. You're not going to get to heaven by keeping the law and not breaking any laws. The only way you're going to get to heaven is by Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man's coming to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. You know? He 
said, I have the keys. I have the keys of death. Of course, he has a final victory. And so that's the way the Bible ends up. The Lord triumphs over death. In the first paragraph that Benjamin Franklin wrote, it is the will of God of this one letter he wrote, he said, it is the will of God that these mortal bodies be laid aside when the soul is to enter the real life. Benjamin Franklin, when your soul, or you means your spirit, our friend and I were invited aboard on a party of pleasure which is to last forever. His chair was ready first. I could say the same thing about Larry or Charlie, huh? Huh? Or, or how about Kay or some of the other ones that have died and gone ahead of us, you know? Their chair was set before them, you know? And, and, and they went before. And, but you know what? We couldn't all conveniently start together. They're there waiting on us. They're, they're doing their thing right now in heaven. They're waiting on us. They're not in the grave. They're, they're, they're not somewhere in limbo somewhere. They're in heaven. They're waiting on us. You know, you know, Benjamin Franklin says, till then, okay, I'll see you then. He knew he was going to die. And he knew that his friends had already gone before him. And it wasn't something he was afraid of. We don't have to fear this death. We don't have to fear this crossing. You know, we, we look at life in the wrong way. We celebrate birthdays. And we dread the, the death days. It should be just the opposite. We should celebrate death days. They've gone to be with the Lord. How much better could it be? But you know what? So many people are not saved. And they're concerned because they know where the, their loved ones are going. They're going to hell. Yeah, that's why they're dreading death. Because they don't want to be judged. Because they know they've been bad. They've been sinful. And they haven't done the right thing in their lives. Benjamin Franklin's friend had died, but that was only because his chair had been welcomed before his. You know, death is an enemy, but death is conquered by our Lord. Our heavenly home is going to be bright and fair. You know, remember that song we sing? I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Oh, Lord, he's been so good to me. Upon those mansions, I can see. My home is not here. It's there. There's where our home is. You know, we're just pilgrims. We're passing through. This, this land is not our home. And the only way we can get to heaven is shed these mortal bodies and take up immortality. That's how we go to heaven. We got rid of, we have to get rid of these bodies that we have because they're holding us down. We're going to have a glorified body one day that will be able to live here on earth. But we'll be also able to live in heaven because we'll have a glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15.53 For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Well, think about where you're at this morning. Are you standing with God? Or you run with the world. If you're standing with God, you don't have no fear. Because one day, we're all going to be risen. We're all going to come out of the grave. Verse 54 When the corruptible have put on the incorruption, the mortal shall have put on the immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written Death is swallowed up in victory. And what's the next verse saying, Marie? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? You know, it's going to be a day when Marie recognizes her mama. Yeah, she's going to run over there and say, Hey, mama. But you know what? Who else is going to be there? Her grandmama. She's going to be there. Her granddad. And my dad. And her dad. Yeah. All those ones that you love, they're going to be there. Because God is preserving them for us. And He's preserving us for them. They had their chairs waiting before our chairs were ready. 
They've already got a seat there. They've already secured their home. But Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. Their place is prepared before ours. He's still working on ours. We're going to get to go to our place before long. Are you ready? Are you ready to go there? I'm ready. I don't have nothing else I need to do. I'm ready to go. Right now, this moment. I don't have to change clothes. I don't have to go brush my teeth. What? Well, they're store-bought teeth anyway, so whatever. It won't matter. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything I need to go do. I'm ready to go to heaven. If you're not ready this morning, I invite you to come to the altar and talk to God. I can't save you, but I know a man who can. I can't do nothing for you, but I know a man who can. I tried to tell you about him this morning. I probably haven't done a very good job. There's probably a lot of people do a whole lot better job than I can do up here. But you know what? I'm working with what he gave me. With the limited amount of intelligence that he gave me, and the limited amount of vocabulary that I have, I can't even form the words that I need to tell you that you need to come to him. I wish I had some words that I could say. That you could you, you, you come to him and he could help you. I don't I don't have the words. It's not in my vocabulary. <laughs> but I wish I wish I could. I wish I could tell you what it's going to be like when we get to heaven, but I, I can't tell you. I have not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. I can tell you that. I can tell you what the Bible says. But where do the words come from? Those are God's words. He said these words. He's saying to you right now, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Yeah, come to Jesus this morning. He'll give you rest. Think about where you're at. Jesus, uh, Marie's going to give us a song of invitation. Come, come to Jesus this morning. Talk to him. Say, Lord, you know what? I've been running in my own way for so long. I don't know what's left to do with your way. And Lord, I just don't know if I can do it your way. But I know one thing. If I trust you, you'll show me. Because I trust you enough to know that you're going to show me the way you want me to go. So think about that this morning. I've been up here for an hour and 12 minutes according to this clock thing that's in time with me. It's time to, for us to get ready to go home. Are you ready to go to your eternal home? Think about that as you come. Will you give us a song of invitation, please? <laughs>